When I was growing up, I never really had a whole lot of disposable income. So whenever it came to picking what phone to buy, I'd be faced with the exact same dilemma. I'd have, let's say, a few hundred dollars. Do I buy a new mid-range phone or do I buy an older flagship phone? And this question is just as important today. If you had $400 now, you have a choice. You could either buy 2020 phones like the Samsung Galaxy A71, the Xiaomi Mi Note 10 Lite, or the Oppo Find X2 Lite. But if you hopped over to eBay, you could also find, for the same price, older 2018 flagship phones, like the Samsung Galaxy Note 9, the Xiaomi Mi Mix 3, or the Oppo Find X, all in new condition as well. So now that I've sourced all of them, which option actually makes more sense? Well, for starters, if you care about this, one point goes to the older phones in terms of the unboxing experience. This kind of makes sense. I mean, even though the mid-range phones are newer, you would just expect to get more stuff with a phone that was intended for a higher price point. So on the Samsung, that means a whole jigsaw puzzle of adapters and some nicer quality AKG earphones versus the cheap ones you get with the A71. If you went down the Oppo route, then this means an arguably cooler case and a headphone jack adapter. And it's a similar story with Xiaomi. The Mi Mix 3 has a nicer case, and it actually even comes with a wireless charger of its own. So the flagships are getting a point for this, but what about the phones themselves? Well, there's actually quite a few things that are comparable, like sizing. Yes, top-end phones tend to be bigger, but newer phones are also bigger, so the size kind of balances out. And memory. Flagship phones tend to have more memory, but at the same time, every couple of years, all phones see a bump in how much memory is considered necessary. So in almost every case, both the RAM and the storage capacity you get is bang on identical between these two camps of phones. So it's squaring up to be quite a fair fight, but now is where we start to see differences. I think the first thing you'll notice when you pick up an older flagship is that there's a certain quality to it. It's partly high grade materials, but it's also partly the fact that flagships cut less corners. You get a whole load of subtle features that add up to a better feeling phone, like a really high-end vibration motor for great haptic feedback. Plus, little things for peace of mind, like an IP water and dust resistance rating in a lot of cases, or wireless charging. I could pick up the Galaxy Note 9, use it for two minutes, and tell you straight away that it is a premium experience, even if it is a premium experience from a couple of years ago. But with a mid-ranger, in some shape or form, you lose some of this quality. Like Samsung's A71 is made of plastic versus the glass of the Note 9. Or Xiaomi's Note 10 Lite is made of glass, which is good, but their flagship is still a level above that. They combine ceramic with 7000 series aluminium. And in a similar vein, the Oppo Find X2 Lite feels well built, but it doesn't have the same density as the Find X. These are subtle differences, but I would say they add up to something more noticeable. And it's actually not just quality. I would say nine times out of 10, a flagship phone has some sort of, I don't have a better name for this, cool factor. At least one defining characteristic that is used in marketing to try and justify people paying the thousand dollars that they initially had to for a lot of these phones. So for the Note 9, it's the S Pen. Brilliant little tool providing you're someone who wants a stylus. Xiaomi is a slider phone. You put a bit of pressure on the screen, give it a pull, and out pops the front camera, ready to take a selfie. And then Oppo, along a similar line, has both its front and back cameras on this motorized pop-up system. This was considered epic when it came out. By comparison, mid-range phones are practical, less showy. I mean, when you're building a phone for a $400 price point, you can't afford to be as crazy with it. Your focus is instead on just getting as many of the key things in as possible. So at this stage, we're at three points to the flagships and zero to the modern mid-range. And there's more. If you're enjoying this video, by the way, though, a sub to the channel would be incredible. We're trying to hit 5 million by the end of 2020. See if we can do it. Anyways, I even go as far as to say that you'll get better display quality if you go for older too. This isn't 100% clear cut, because on one hand, this Galaxy A71's display looks modern, and I would take this little hole punch any day over the pretty chunky bezels on the Note 9. I want to tell you this screen is better, but it just isn't. If you look a little closer, it has that slightly over-sharpened look you get from cheaper phones, whereas the Note always displays images in what feels like an organic way. And this is important. For example, when you're taking photos on the Note 9, what you see on your phone is an accurate representation of what the camera is actually capturing. Whereas if you did the same thing on your Galaxy A71 and then transferred that file to your laptop, you might not actually see quite the same thing. The two Xiaomi displays I would say are pretty similar in quality, but you see this trend again when you look at Oppo. The Find X2 light screen is not bad at all, but the Find X is in almost all aspects bolder 
And to top all of this off, chances are, if you buy an older flagship phone, you're getting a phone that's also more powerful. These 2018 flagships are all packing top shelf Snapdragon 845 chipsets. These 2020 offerings, they're all equipped with newer, but middle of the line equivalents. And we're just not at a stage where those have quite overtaken the best that 2018 had to offer. So if you take a look at these benchmark scores, every one of these flagship phones scores higher than 2000 points in terms of overall multi-core performance. Every one of these mid-ranges scores less. But this is where we start to see those mid-rangers gain back some territory because there's a very important caveat to those numbers that these older top-end chips, they take more of a toll on your battery. They're based on an older 10 nanometer fabrication process versus the newer ones based on eight or even seven. I sometimes like to think of it in terms of cars. If you buy an older flagship phone, you're gonna have a really big, bulky, but powerful engine under the hood. But with a newer mid-range, you're getting a smaller but sleeker and more energy efficient engine. And for most people, one that will still perform good enough. But I'll call this one a draw. And while we're at it, I would also say that cameras are a draw. See, here's the thing. Humans are a little biased when it comes to looking at the past. We're not very good at remembering how good something actually was, only really remembering how it made us feel. So because the Galaxy Note 9 camera was amazing at the time, because it made us feel impressed, most people would just assume that it's tons better than the current mid-range, because of course, those haven't evoked that same emotional response. But the reality of it is, they trade blows. Pretty much every flagship phone from 2018 had just two cameras, and fairly low resolution cameras at that, 12 or maybe 16 megapixels on the main sensor. Now compare that to these phones, which all have no less than four cameras and main sensors that look a hell of a lot better. Resolutions of 64, 64 and 48 megapixels and just larger sensor areas. These mid-range phones are stacked in the camera department. So what does that mean for photos? Well, take the two Samsung phones. The mid-range one comes with a newer, more advanced image processing engine. So I can actually sit with it in a dark room and still capture detail in the bright sky. If we move over to the Oppos, you can see that these newer, bigger image sensors, they are capturing more information. We can crop in here and you can see that the Find X2 Lite has noticeably less noise and it just picks up more of the textures on objects, providing you're in good lighting. And if we jump over to Xiaomi's, don't underestimate the benefit of having just more cameras. You'll get an ultra wide on these mid ranges to take sweeping shots like this, and quite often a macro camera too, to get you closer to subjects. But as I've been using these side by side for the last week or so, it's becoming quite clear to me that there's a lot of not so obvious things that flagship phones have that actually make the camera experience a higher quality camera experience. You've got almost without fail a faster shutter speed because these phones are more powerful and they're capturing fewer pixels because of their lower res cameras. So for this shot right here, the flower was moving pretty fast in the wind, but even then the older Note 9 could still capture it fast enough to fully preserve its details. You can see the A71s isn't quite as crisp as it should be. And optical image stabilization. Pretty much every flagship will have it. Pretty much no phone made for $400 will have it. And it does exactly what it says on the tin. It uses optics to stabilize your camera itself to kind of offset the movements you're inevitably going to make when taking a photo. And there's no better way to show the benefits of this than trying to take a night mode shot. So I'm standing in the dark right now, and by default, the newer A71 can see more of the texture of the floor. This isn't surprising, it has a better camera sensor, but because of its stabilization, the Galaxy Note 9 can capture this night mode photo for longer than the A71 without blurring it. So when you look at the end result, it's actually managed to get more light in there and therefore more detail in there. And optical image stabilization also means that video looks way better. Good stabilization is as important as resolution for video, and mid-rangers just don't have it. Also, the second camera that you do get on these flagships is almost always a proper two-time zoom camera, whereas for a lot of these mid-rangers, one of those four cameras is just a depth sensor. So if we're being fair, I would really say this is more a comparison of three versus two cameras as opposed to four versus two. But I think the overall battle of cameras, it could go either way. I'm gonna call it a draw. So now that we've covered almost all the key pillars of a smartphone, it's looking like an obliteration. And that is the first part of our conclusion that as far as the core phone experience goes, you are getting more if you go for an older flagship. But the 2020 mid-range comes with three key perks that aren't immediately obvious. Number one is battery. I already mentioned that these newer phones have more power efficient chips, but add to that that the trend in 2020 just seems to be to also have massive battery cells. 
So you've got more physical battery in a phone that's going to use that battery slower. And there's something else. See, batteries degrade over time. They degrade when you use them, but what a lot of people don't realize is that they degrade even when they're not being used. So when you buy an older phone from a few years ago, unless they've specifically told you that the battery has been replaced, chances are you're buying a phone that already has two years worth of battery degradation. And that's a huge deal because whilst on this side, I'm quite likely getting a phone that could last me through two full days of use. On this side, I'm getting a phone where I might have to be conservative just to get one full day of use. As a matter of fact, this Galaxy Note 9, I had to charge it by 3 p.m. on the first day I was setting it up. That's not great. The second thing is software. If we say that these flagship phones are getting two years of major Android updates and these mid-rangers are just getting one, which is a rough trend we tend to see, then that would still mean that the mid-rangers are getting a whole extra year of new features and support. So all these phones right now are on a pretty level playing field, but by the end of 2021, it's definitely possible that these mid-rangers might leave the older phones behind. But here is what I would say the decision ultimately hinges on. The third perk. While you can get for $400 an older flagship phone, more than likely to get that, you're going to be shopping on eBay or some equivalent. So you miss out on peace of mind. You can quite easily limit the chances of things going wrong by only shopping with trusted sellers and going with ones with lots of feedback. But with almost all of these sites, after 30 or 60 days, you'll have a very tough time returning anything or getting any customer support at all. We're in a minority. We are tech people. We're the kind of people who we'd be willing to take a risk if it means we might get better features. But for the vast majority of the population, I would estimate that their top priority above screen quality and camera quality is, I want my phone to just work. I don't want problems. So for people like this, the value of having a printed warranty, a customer support helpline, a physical store that you can go back into and talk to people about it with is pretty important. And this you don't get when buying an older flagship phone, unless you find a way to buy it in store, but it probably won't be as cheap as it is online. If you like this video, then I've got a video here that I think you'll love. And I should probably caveat this by saying this applies to Android phones only. If you're picking an iPhone, Apple has a very different way of positioning its mid-range phones, so the comparison is different. Anyways, my name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.